Thank you, Seoul High School, for that beautiful performance. Please join me in welcoming the moderator of our panel on creative brilliance, how the arts interact with the sciences, Marianne Bongiorni. Marianne Bongiorni is an accomplished artist seeking to link the characteristics of solace amidst a beautiful environment with beating the odds of tragedy. She has recently lectured about the role of the arts in the STEM fields of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, seeing the natural coupling of the worlds of art and science. Please join me in welcoming the University of Montana's Professor of Drawing, Mary Ann Bongiorni. Thank you. Um, no, in the middle. Um, wow, this is a great conference, and I am so thrilled to be asked to help moderate this first panel. Wonderful introductory talks. Now, get ready for the bull in the china shop, folks, because I'm it. Um, I, I moved here from Las Vegas, and I immediately took on the task of coaching the rodeo team. Uh, so, if you want to know about roping horses, cattle, trucks and trailers, changing tires, and how to make a hub out of a canned peach can, I'm the gal. All right, and so what I want to say to all of you is that I celebrate you. The reason I'm here is because I believe in art, and I am steadfastly convinced that art and the ideas of diplomacy can help us move into the next decade and to the future. Um, our two wonderful doctors today, I'd like to introduce, recently received their PhDs, and I will read their bios. Dr. Merritt Moore is a ballet dancer, quantum physicist, jumping from lab shoes and goggles to point shoes and tutus. She has danced as a member of the Zurich Ballet, Boston Ballet, English National Ballet, and London Contemporary Ballet Theater, and graduated with honors in physics from Harvard University. Moore recently received her PhD in quantum optics. I don't even know what that is, so we're going to have to ask her. Um, quantum optics and from Oxford University in, in hopes to inspire more young women to study science by showing them that there are no standard personalities or paths for doing so. She believes the arts and sciences are not mutually exclusive, and Moore has been working hard to juggle them both, encouraging other students to do the same. Moore was one of Glamour Magazine's top 10 college women in 2010, was awarded Harvard's prestigious Michael Von Klemm Fellowship, and has won Oxford's TEDx Talks Dance With Your PhD competition in physics category. Our second panelist, and let's, I don't know, let's call it a discussion. How about that, all right? Is Erica Rose Jeffrey, also a doctor, uh, she believes in the power of movement is connected to the positive social change. Originally from Missoula, Montana, yep, yep, yeah. Jeffrey studied dance at the Pittsburgh Ballet Theater School before joining Ballet International. After dancing professionally for several years, she attended, attended Indiana University as a Wells Scholar and graduated with degrees in ballet and meditation and conflict resolution. Since 2001, Erica has been working to connect dance, empathy, and peace, and she has worked internationally as a performer, choreographer, educator, arts leader, and facilitator. Jeffrey was also the first dancer to be selected as a Rotary World Peace Fellow, which led her to complete a Master's in Peace and Conflict Studies at the University of Queensland. Jeffrey's PhD work built upon her belief in the power of movement, investigating the connections of dance, empathy, and peace at Queensland University of Technology. She is currently the director for dance for Parkinson's Australia and also the director of peace and conflict studies at the Institute of Australia. So please, with no further ado, welcome our two doctors. Our panel's format today 
today is we're going to start with some electronic images. Um, we'll start with a couple videos and then we're, and we'll invite the two panelists to speak respectively about the images that they've submitted. Then I will go into a Q&A where I get to ask them a lot of great questions and hopefully we get to know them a little bit better as people. And then I would like, to, if we have time, to open it up to the audience. So as you're experiencing this discussion, then be thinking if you have any questions for our two panelists. All right, so with that, I think, um, let's see, Shanti, should we start? Are we ready? Okay, we'll start with Erica. We'll start with you. All right. Um, yeah, these are already on. Are there microphones on, Shanti? Yeah, I think they are. Go ahead. Good morning to everyone. Good morning. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so this is a video from Australia, from Sydney, uh, and some of the participants in uh, Dance for Parkinson's classes there. So um, like many people, I wear multiple hats, and so this will let the participants themselves talk a little bit about the Dance for Parkinson's program. There'll be some shots inside the Sydney Opera House as well. So sitting beautifully tall, Richard, if you'd like to start. Just listening to the music. People look at me and say, I'd never guess you had Parkinson's because I don't have a tremor. Deep breath and breathing in. I've been diagnosed for 10 years, but the last couple of years have been particularly challenging and it's getting more and more challenging. Parkinson's is a community dance class for people with Parkinson's and their partners or caregivers or family members. We've been married for 47 years. We've been going um, since it started. With the dancing, you just take the fear away from your falling over. In the consultation room, I often get on my soapbox and give a little lecture about the importance of physical activity, social interaction, mental stimulation, and Dance for PD uh, gives all three of those. It's definitely helped with my walking, yes, and it's helped with my balance too. I'm certainly conscious of the fact that I don't get some of the movements a lot of the time and you know it doesn't matter and that's what's really nice and so you can look around and see that other people aren't getting it either and that's quite reassuring. inspirational people around me carrying on with life so it's wonderful it, it was that sense of being able to use your body in a way that wasn't like being a person with Parkinson's Shanti, do we have the second video for, okay, we got it. Go ahead, Erica. So we work closely with the Dance for PD program that is uh, with the Mark Morris Dance Group in New York. And we just wanted to show how dance can also be involved in innovation and in moving ahead in solving some of those complex problems um, the president spoke about earlier. So this is just a short video about one of the projects that they've been engaged in. Parkinson's is a debilitating movement disorder that affects more than a million people in the United States, including 50 to 60,000 new people every year. And to date, there is no known cure. That's why SSK built Moving Through Glass, the first ever augmented reality application that uses wearable technology to provide round-the-clock aid to people living with Parkinson's. It started with the realization within Mark Morris Dance Group's Dance for PD program. 
The classes using the training and techniques of professional dance to enhance the balance, power, and coordination of Parkinson's sufferers were falling short in a critical way. Participants like me needed tools we could take beyond the classroom and into our daily lives. The agency was asked to find a solution. SSK started with analyses, from classroom methods to available technologies to specialized user needs. Extending Google's Glass platform, they built custom software to maximize performance and simplify user inputs. Then they worked with instructors to distill choreography and music into short, stimulating modules to guide and inspire movement. From seated warm-up and balance building, to walking stimulation and restart techniques in case users got stuck. SSNK shot original footage, recorded new music, and then tested with class participants. Finally, Moving Through Glass was presented to leading researchers at the Weill Cornell Medical Center. They requested their own glass for testing and called the application amazing, ingenious, and incredibly promising. Okay, glass. Balance me. Shifting one side to the other. Now, students like me have the tools to navigate the world outside the studio, whenever, wherever we need them. to Merit and some images that you'd like to speak about some of these images, Merit? Is that all right? Does this work? Okay, cool. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, I just submitted some images, I think, well, we can show. It was just my, um, yeah, it was uh, my dressing room with the ballet and then jumping back into the physics lab. So I've taken time off, so I do two years of college and then one year dancing with a professional ballet company and or I was dancing double shows of Nutcracker at Boston Ballet and in between the shows. So I'd like rip off the point shoes, jump in a taxi, get to the lab and then put on like the full on suit with the double boots and the gloves and the head mask and everything, deposit this metal on, a, on my nano chip and then have to take everything off, put on the point shoes and the fake eyelashes and then jump in a taxi, get back to perform that night and then go back and do finish up the experiment at like 2 a.m. in the lab. Um, little did I know though, because I'd have double shows the next day, so I'd be stretching with my leg up while I was depositing this metal because it would take so long. And at the end of the month, the security guards came to me and were like, Mary, you know that there's CCTV cameras like on the thing. I was like, oh, I should have known. Um, yeah, so these are just images of my dance world and the physics world, which have always been quite separate. So I'd have to hide that I was dancing so much from the physics world and hide from the dance world. Like I'd kind of sneakily have my physics book underneath my dressing room table and then like just pretend like I was going out for lunch and then go and study. Um, so they've always been very separate. And then at the end of the day, now this year, I've just had it. I was like, I'm kind of sick of hiding these two passions from both of the worlds. And it just drives me crazy when people say like to young kids, like you either have an analytic mind or a creative mind and I'm, like at this point, I'm just like, no, there's no such thing as having two separate brains. Like people ask me, oh, is it hard to swap brains? I'm like, it's the same brain. It really is. Like I use the same creativity in dance in the science world and the same analytic processing in the dance world. So that's my slide. <laughs> Thank you, Merit. That's great. I, and actually, maybe we can start the discussion now, ladies. Um, um, I want to pick up on what you just mentioned and maybe could you go to the next layer about how you do that? How do you vacillate between these two worlds that maybe from the outside we think of them? And I think that's probably a product of how we have developed knowledge um, in categories um, and then how you uh, bring those together. Yeah. Definitely passion, right? Because everyone I'd have incredible mentors and they always wanted the best for me, but their advice was always, Mary, you, like the physics professors would always say, Mary, you need to quit this dancing if you want to be a physicist. And in the dance world, all the dance teachers who really wanted me to be the best that I could be would tell me I need to quit the physics um, if I really want to pursue dancing. But I do believe that now it's really helped to have two passions because I can see so many of my peer fellow dancers who have only done dance their entire lives, like quit high school at age 12 and have just been dancing, 
they're completely burnt out, they're retired because, and it's not just physically, but I think mentally, something's just died in them, and, and, and then physically, they've become injured. And part of that is, I think, that because you're in a studio all the time, because you're getting critique all the time, and it's mostly the critique of yourself, like I'm the worst of it, I'm always like, oh my god, Mary, you're the worst, like, you're so bad, like your feet are so bad, and this and that. Um, but like that and the emphasis of the mirror, and so there's so much critique that just eats away at people, and after a decade, it just, you kind of burn out. But having two passions, like having the science, I'd be so excited because I'd been sitting in a library for eight hours or sitting over an optics table like doing this. I was just like so excited to get into the dance studio and move that all of those worries and anxiety just, I didn't have time for it. And I was just so appreciative to be in the room. Do you, do you feel, um, talk a little bit about intuition. How does intuition play into both science and dance for you? Um, so, it, well, now I, I test, and I'm sure you guys do this with the Parkinson's, but um, playing around with improv, because I think having, trusting your gut, or trusting just your sensation of what's going to happen when the music plays, and you just let yourself move and go with the flow, you begin to trust your own body, you get to trust your own gut, you get to trust, and you feel what feels most natural. And I love watching dancers who are also classically trained and told what to do, but they perform in a way that's unique and individual to themselves. And I think as well in the physics world, nowadays, the education process drives me crazy because like you're just taught to memorize and you have to do well on these SAT school like tests and you have to get an 800 and like just memorize it and do well. Learn, and I, learn the test. Learn the test. And right. I did, I was just like, memorize the method or like you see the pattern and I'd be like I have no idea what this harmonic oscillator is doing but whatever I can figure it out um, and you do well on the exam but you have no idea what you're you have no intuition for the physics but having done more dancing and doing improv I now realize when I'm reading the physics I'm like I kind of tune into that aspect that I've been practicing of like oh, okay no 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 Merit like think for yourself like think what does this mean for me? Possibly like, trust yourself. Trust, trust myself, yeah. Mm -hmm. And be like, okay, there's a different way. Like Einstein was so good at that, right? He used his creativity and imagination first before going to mathematical I have, equations. I have one more question for you. Um, and this is because I'm, a, like I said, I'm the bull in the china shop. And then I want to <laughs> move on and ask Erica a couple questions. Can you talk a little bit about exactly what you do with quantum physics? Yeah, um, so I work in the atomic and physics atomic and laser physics department, so specifically quantum optics, and we work with um, particles of light called photons. So part of my PhD was creating two sources to create pairs of photons. Um, that entailed having a big high-powered laser that if you put your hand through it, it would burn. I experienced that a couple of times. Don't do that. <laughs> so you have a high-powered laser. It interacts. You have it shine off mirrors and lenses. It goes into a crystal. And there's an interaction that happens when the laser light hits the crystal that produces pairs of photons, which we could then have going through fibers and we would sneak these fibers across the ceiling and downstairs to our detectors without, you know, late at night because the, the building faculty couldn't know about it. Um, and we'd have these like fibers going through all over the place and we'd send the photons there and you can interfere them and detect them. and. Well, as a faculty member, Merit, I, I, I'll tell you what I tell my students. What I don't know doesn't hurt me as long as it's clean at 8 o'clock Monday morning. Yeah, okay. no one knows. It's all good. <laughs> People might be stuck in the pipes for a little bit, but we get them out by 8 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that explains it. Now we all know what that is. <laughs> um, Eric, I'd like to move on to how you combine um, your research. I think. Um, as primarily a social scientist, correct? That it's sort of built in some of the integral parts of that. Could, could you please speak to that a little bit? Sure, sure. Well, I think that if we look at, so the two areas that I work in are around dance and peace, or so dance and international relations, and then dance and health. And so within those, there's both the, the process of, of analysis, of, of doing research, um, but also how we apply that kind of thinking. So. Um, you know, in the aspect of, of, say, going to do a peace building program in, I work a lot in Papua New Guinea. 
So a, a lot of that is about um, you know, looking at the, what is the problem, defining what the problem is. So you're using uh, a process of um, sort of analysis and then decision about how are we going to go in and address that, a lot of reflection, and then, okay, what do we want to do now? So then reapplying the way that you're going to think about things, which is the same that a lot of dancers do. So if you're a dancer and you're having trouble with your pirouettes, you, you look at what the problem is, you analyze it, you try some new things, you reflect, did that work or not? And then you use that to build forward in your dance training. In the, the dance and health aspect, so with Parkinson's, we work a lot with um, across sectors. So we'll be working with um, dance artists, musicians, physiotherapists, neuroscientists. And so it brings a lot of different knowledge into the room. And so we're using lots of different ways of measuring things, which is quite interesting because one of the things that we may see in the Dance for Parkinson's program is that sometimes what we see in a dance class cannot necessarily be measured in the lab. And so part of that is how do we have that conversation with people who see things differently than us and measure things differently to really understand what's happening. And I think that that's quite exciting because a lot of that research involves both quantitative, so looking at numbers, and qualitative research. What are the stories? What are people saying about the experience? So to be able to combine those things creates, I think, a fuller picture of what's actually happening. All right, thank you. Um, what I'd like to do now, in, in particular, um, I formed this idea after um, stepping into uh, Ballet Without Borders. I, I have to tell you, I walked in there thinking, okay, okay, all right, let's just check this out. I couldn't leave. It was amazing. You guys are absolutely amazing. The discipline, the, the, the um, physical um, abilities, I, I was astounded. And I also thought, wow, I'm 60. If I start to dance now, maybe at 70, I can do something besides shuffle off the buffalo. Um, so, <laughs> you know, and a grapevine. Uh, so you've inspired me. I, I will have, I'll keep track and tell you in two years what I'm doing, all right? Um, you, oh, you said it to everyone. You have to. Oh, no, I have to do it now. It's like, okay, bearing witness. Let's see what the old gal is going to do next. Um, uh, I, I have been practicing playing the ukulele above standing on a horse, but I, now I can do it w with one foot. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> True story. Um, um, what I'd like to do is back up for when you were younger, and maybe each of you, I'll, um, I'll start with Merritt again, talk a little bit about where you grew up and how dance and science um, maybe emerged, um, came to the top of the pond for you. Um, yeah, so I've, I, I was a kid, I didn't speak until I was three, and even there, and I, I spoke like the bare minimum, like I, I just, I think I t articulated things with my body, and but would say sentences like very short sentences and not very frequently. Um, and I grew up in a family, but um, that emphasized academics. And so I I grew a fondness for math. I loved math and I loved puzzles. It just made sense to me. Words did not. And then when I was 13, I don't know. My mom said that I wasn't allowed to do extracurriculars until I was 13. And finally, I, there was some bribe that. I, I was forced to do ballet because she wanted me to have good posture, um, but only for a year. And, but then after the year, she wanted me to quit. And I was like, no, I, I actually really like this. <laughs> like, this is sticking with me. And so that's where I just continued dancing. Um, you know, I never thought I was going to do it professionally, for sure. And went to Harvard. And oddly, it was performing there. There were tons of opportunities. There's tons of student-run organizations and as students we would just put on shows and performing in, in with a really friendly audience of friends that's what I think made it possible to go on audition to and get into Zurich Ballet. That's great so you, you were able to sustain that through college I mean yeah that, during which is I mean really college was amazing. my training which yeah. is and yeah. but that was also I mean I was I was also nuts like I, that was like 
40, 50 hours of homework that I was doing per week. Uh, okay, so let's let's just get to the quick <laughs> here, folks. If you're type A and codependent and poor, you'll be a really great dancer, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> because you will have to just like muster it up and love it for whatever it is. You just love is. it. Yeah. And so if it takes like studying in the splits, you study in the splits or, right. you know, in lectures, I'd be doing my feet exercises and sit like this. So it looked like I was leaning against the chair, but I'd be doing my abs like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try that, everybody. Are you ready? <laughs> you can have an hour ab workout. Yeah, there you go. Erica, what about you? Uh, well, as you mentioned, I did grow up here in beautiful Missoula, Montana. Uh, and I think from a very young age, I had passion of dance um, and also this idea of peace or social justice. And so for me, that really came a lot from my grandmother, Millie Jeffrey. Um, she was a very petite woman, but a, a giant agent of change. She was a recipient of the Presidential um, Medal of uh, Freedom, the highest civilian honor that someone can receive in the States, uh, for her work in civil rights, women's rights, and the labor rights movement. And she would, the other thing about Millie is that she would always show up for my performances. So she was a huge supporter of the arts, and uh, that was quite important to me. But she would also ask me critical questions, like, why are there only girls in your dance class? Why are there not more people, a more diverse group of people in your dance classes? Tell me a little bit more about ballet and how it functions in society. This was when I was nine. So, um, so these questions are things I've been thinking about for, for a long time. And you know, I agree with what Merit is saying, that this idea of that you have to pick one thing. Again, people are continually telling me, you need to pick one thing and focus on that. And I understand the value of that, but I also understand, the, for me personally, the richness and be able, being able to cross between different disciplines, different ways of windows into the world, and how, for me, that really uh, enriches my experience and the way in which I'm able to navigate different situations. For example, in a lot of cases, if I'm doing more sort of strict uh, sort of peace building work, it can get very focused on what are the words that are pe people are saying and not so focused on what is the, the body language or the cultural context that we're engaging in. So th from my dance lens, I can look in and say, oh, you know, now might be a good time for us to incorporate some song into this meeting. Or what is, you know, asking some stories that might have meaning that can help shift the conversation in, in another direction. So, so for me, I think the idea of those, those two passions um, going together. And you know, Charlene has been such a, a great um, ambassador for that here in Montana by connecting people. Um, and I have had adventures with Charlene in the international community. And it's always really wonderful about the relationships. And I think that that's whatever field, the, the dance for young dancers, for working in, in peace work, for working in the dance and health uh, with Dance for Parkinson's, it's about those relationships that we form and how we nurture those relationships. And I think that when we look at the idea of, of dance and peace, or if we look at arts and diplomacy, a lot of people in peace building, you'll see like theorists will talk about the idea of these networks of relationships, the webs of relationships, and that's how we build peace from either the top down, say the more formal forms of peace building like nation building, or the more grassroots levels. But where I think the arts play a role is that in between all of that, that web are the places where the arts are. And often it's the arts experience that creates the space for those relationships to be built around that then create that web and network. I would agree with that. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Um, and you answered about five of my questions quite articulately. Yes, you guys are on it. So um, <clears throat> uh, I wanna go to history for a minute. Um, could you, th is there a, and when you think of the history of science has, as it has been um, in your respective areas uh, offered to you or delivered, and the history of dance, are there um, people, practitioners, um, theories that have inspired you? And if so, what are they? That's kind of a surprise question. I'm sorry. If, yeah, but I figure you're smart. Hey, you're doctors. So um, um, actually, Erica, let's go to you on this one. Um, well, I think that it's interesting because sometimes it's the dancers that inspire me in 
other parts of my life as far as the, the political science. So I, I work more in, so as opposed to like physics science, more political science. Um, and I think that, um, you know, for example, Agnes DeMille, famous dancer, she talks about how the, the, you know, the truest way to understand a people is through their, through their dance and their music because bodies never lie. And for me, I really think about that idea of that sort of that, those nonverbal connections. I'm, I'm continually inspired, actually not so much by the big names, but by the, the sort of people I meet on, on the smaller scale. Can so, you describe that? Yeah, so for example, um, you know, you can come up with a really fancy, um, you know, term about collaborative narrative practice in community facilitation work. But when I'm in a village in the southern Philippines or in Bougainville, Papua New Guinea, and you have this interaction with our colleagues there who are working and doing these you know, complex relational processes in, in the village without a PowerPoint, you know, they might have written things on the back of a rice sack, but really engaging in, in, in this practice of, of sort of trying to improve their lives there, to me that's what's inspiring. And of course, you know, I've, you know we can take all of the big names, but I just want to honor the people who are doing the work on a, on a daily basis. No, and that, you know, that's one of the things that I appreciate by the selection of having the both of you here is that um, I, I think there's room for that breadth of inspiration. Um, what, uh, I'll mention something, then I want to go on and ask the same question of merit. But when I was reading through the roster of um, people who are, will be speaking today, and I told Erica this earlier, I said, wow, I saw the word movement a lot. And when, you know, when I was going through school, dance didn't, I mean, movement was always integral to it, but it was not really specified as something you could concentrate on. It was, it's, it's developed through the years vis-a-vis -vis through probably um, other influences, maybe talking about non-academic situations or um, even contemporary dance, that movement really became something more of a focus. And I was very happy to see that in the descriptions of what people do um, and their professionally. Um, so historically, Merit, um, are there either practitioners, uh, times in history, what do you look at um, for inspiration? Yeah. Well, Galileo was a good example, but um, Einstein for me, I'm such a fan girl of Einstein, but because he, I mean, when he discovered special relativity, right? Like he didn't go to the equations of like, you know, the gradient of the electric field equals like the derivative of the magnetic field, right? Like he, what he imagined was he visualized himself he went to the movement of the physics and he went, oh, okay, what is it like to be a light particle going like through space and try to visualize being an electromagnetic wave? And that's how he came up with special relativity. And later on, he admits that he then had to, he knew he was right, intuitively he knew he was right, but then he went and proved it mathematically so that he could get his colleagues to understand it. But like, he first went to like his imagination and creativity and so for that i'm like he's my like yeah so he's your go-to guy. Go guy yeah and i and i i've always appreciated that too um um in in the visual arts my background that is always used as the example because it's so kinesthetic that it's um, a tactile situation for visual artists um all right i i the next question i'd like to ask is as we look to the future and the different projects that both of you are doing could you talk a little bit about what you think is on the horizon like you might probably already have some things in the hopper and then maybe what is that in relation to the future of art. You know, I think we're in very interesting times worldwide right now, politically. Um, how does art play a part of that? Yeah. Um, well, I think there's an essence of live performances that are so incredibly important in this day and age, especially now that we're used to the screens and et cetera. Like, there's some sort of thing where, like, energy is emanated and you just get it on a personal level. So live performances, I think, will always be so Either incredibly- Formal or informal, both. Formal or informal, yeah. so incredibly important and crucial to maintain and, and preserve. Um, other projects, though, that are also, I think, exciting in combining science and arts is 
um, I worked on a virtual reality project that was at the Barbican this spring, and we used art and dance in a way to have people enter rooms where the rooms had like quantum mechanical um, behavior. So a lot of the times in textbooks, you're taught quantum mechanics and being like, so it's this phenomena that you've never experienced, but it happens at a really small level, just you know, believe it. So what I wanted to do was to make it more intuitive. So when people go into a room, you, like in order, so I don't know, should I describe the physics? So if you look at in, in quantum mechanics, like it happens at a very small scale, but if you observe something, it stops moving. You kind of collapse the wave function, but when you look away, it'll start evolving. So for people to exit the room, this rock had to fall to the ground. And so most people would then focus on this rock because that's, for us, that's what we do. But then they'd get bored and look away and the rock would start to fall. That's, so we were trying to get people to get an intuition for the quantum mechanics. And so that's a project combining physics and dance. But also, so we made the experience aesthetic and fun in that sense. So it wasn't like textbook. My, when you say that, I get really excited and I, I think, I would like to see that in a museum, in an art museum. Um, different rooms and walking through and having that experience. So, hey, 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 go to the art museums and see if they'll take on that project. Yeah, yeah, yeah here we are. Um, um, Erica, how about you? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that we are in a place in the world where we are, there's this aspect of, as you mentioned, screens, and so how are we interfacing with the world? And I think things like dance are also being um, used in these interesting ways to explain uh, phenomenon, like scientific phenomenon. But it's also very important to think about this idea of embodiment and how we're continuing to physicalize our presence in the world, how we understand the world, and so that it's not that separation between um, brain and body, but that it's, it's integrated. And so that's a lot of what my, my work has, has focused on and how that, that complete, that integration allows us different ways of seeing and knowing and perhaps p provides those pathways for us to find these new solutions. So if we're looking at the idea of a conflict, um, and, and this is not saying advocating that we use dance within the midst of violent conflict but, conflict, but if you have a meeting of people coming together and it's getting stuck on the verbal level, you know, what are the other ways in which we can use the arts, use embodiment, use physicalization to move the conversation in a different direction? And also this idea of, um, you mentioned improvisation before. There's a lot of emphasis on, you know, if we look at peace building, you know, creativity and peace building, but what are the opportunities to actually practice that creativity? Because creativity doesn't just happen, it's something like you also have to, to encourage, engage, uh, create opportunities for. It's the same thing with the Parkinson's community. Um, when we look at the, the Dance for Parkinson's classes, it's not a cure, it's, it's a quality of life approach um, to, to provide other options, but it's also about um, looking at different ways of cueing. So sometimes with, with people with Parkinson's, they freeze, they, they um, are not able to, to walk, but people will say to me, oh, I'll hum the waltz and I'll, and I'll do a bit of a, a waltzing movement and that gets me going again. And so it's that creativity to be able to use movement to think differently, which literally allows these people to move forward. Um, and I think for me, I'm really interested in how dancers can be involved in these uh, discussions around shaping the future from, uh, say, in dance and health, from a policy perspective. So there's growing arts and health movements here in the United States, in the UK, and in Australia. And these ideas of how do we integrate the arts uh, more completely into to health approaches. And that I think it's very important that dancers have a say in that. So it's not just a doctor prescribing, um, you know, potentially prescribing dance, but dancers are involved in shaping how that might look, um, how are we going to measure if it's working or not, um, and so that that's part of what's happening. Um, as far as things that I'm working on uh, moving forward, so we're, with the Dance for PD program, um, working with the Dance for Parkinson's Australia and Dance for PD in the States, we're um, starting to uh, offer teacher training and programs in China and in Korea and Malaysia, so expanding to work in the Asia-Pacific region. And part of that is to continue to provide 
um, options for people living with Parkinson's disease, but also to continue to grow the bank of knowledge that we have about what are the different ways of moving, what are the different kinds of music, different cultural approaches. And from the dance and peace building perspective, for me, it's about uh, articulating between the, the different forms. So that's what I'm trying to practice a bit more is this idea of how do I translate what's happening in this dance context, like you were describing this experience, this physical experience at the Barbican. How do I translate this into the written page so that then it can be something that maybe an academic might read and say, oh, all right, I can look at it in a different way. How do I then translate these complex theories of, um, or international relations ideas into a dance concept so maybe that they can be um, offered to people who might not necessarily think about that initially and provide them a new way to look at things? Wow. Um, yeah, right? <laughs> um, of course. Coming from the tutorial end of things, I'm thinking, wow, what if we took Erica's situation and collaborated with Merritt's situation, walking through these rooms, um, and I'm thinking... Ukulele. With a, with a, of, course <laughs> of course with a ukulele, horseback. right? On horseback. <laughs> but, but I'm thinking, wow, that would be amazing to see these two sort of trajectories possibly come together. So all I'm going to say is go, doctors, go. Hey, um, I have to tell you, we are up, and um, our time is up. And when I, when I do have to wind this um, down, and we'll get on to the next panel. Um, I encourage you to approach both Erica and Merritt um, and ask any questions you might ask after the panel or as we're walking around today. I'm sure they would be pleased to answer it. And then I also have a little presentation for them because um, I, I was on Merritt's website and she has this beautiful TED talk and it shows her feet, um, a picture of her feet. Do you remember this, Merritt? And they're just beat up, right, from being in point shoes. Do you remember that yeah. image? Yeah. It's, it's a Google image. Oh, it is? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, she said it's a Google image, but I'm thinking, I wonder... Like, what do, people, what do you do with your feet when you're a dancer? And I got to thinking, and I, and I looked and I went, we have point toes, round toes, and square toes. Well, my toes are like boats, right? So I don't wear pointed shoes, and I think they should be retired. However, I'm aware that dancers probably feel differently about this, and so I didn't want to have you leave this discussion without a gift, and I'm going to now present to you. So hold on, folks. <laughs> Yeah, 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 do that. You can do the role. And if you, if you want to know more, the Dance to Your PhD is a really great competition. Um, and so that is also a great way to see some of what Merritt has done with the physics, yeah? So any dancer who wants to do a dorky dance, yeah, there's a competition called Dance Your PhD, and you get to dance about your PhD, which... <laughs> okay, now, I know that there's... <laughs> What's this? I know that there's a baggage check involved in this, so I could ship these to you. However, if we didn't know that you'd have to hand off. Oh. Yeah.
ahead. And we'll go on to the next one.